Hey, it's my review of The Evil Within 2, and this is actually different because I wrote this entire review. So here we go. The Evil Within 2 is an odd beast. On one hand, it's a sequel that far exceeds its predecessor in almost every way. And on the other hand, it completely ignores the diamonds in the rough the first game had. What we're left with is still overall great and a lot of fun, but the endeavor is a tad lifeless. So the story in Evil Within 2 goes out of its way to be more comprehensible this time around. However, it's all built upon the original mess from the first game. Mobius, an Illuminati-esque organization, spent years developing and perfecting STEM, a way to use a host's mind to control countless other people within a fictional dreamlike world. It's kind of like the Matrix, but without the robots. Inside STEM, everyone experiences the same thing, and it's exactly what Mobius, through the host, wants. Sebastian Castellanos is recruited by Mobius through another returning character, Julie Kidman, to help recover the host of the latest STEM experiment, who just so happens to be his daughter, who he thought died in a fire years prior. That's the setup, and it's beyond needlessly convoluted at this point, and I can't help but long for the days when a survival horror game's plot was, hey, your police force is trapped in a mansion, or find your wife in this spooky town, or the president's daughter is in Spain somewhere, go rescue her. While STEM and all that is interesting, it is never fully explained, and after completing the first game, all of its DLC, and the sequel, I still have so many questions. Namely, why are certain people able to control the STEM environment? They give a half answer, but again, it never really tells you what's going on. And I don't, I don't even think they have answers. Thankfully, the new cast and the bulk of the story that isn't built from the previous mess is actually decent. It boils down to standard survive the zombie apocalypse fare and has a handful of memorable moments. Even so, a lot of the dialogue is delivered in a half-hearted, stiff, and emotionless way. I, I can't say it's campy fun. It sounds like the first draft that desperately needed another pass. It's not terrible, but it's mostly forgettable aside from some standout scenes. Almost everything else in The Evil Within 2, though, is a vast improvement. The over-the-shoulder camera angle isn't so claustrophobic and lets players actually see things. This helps out a lot as this is a stealth game now. Bringing in the cover mechanics introduced in the original's DLC, Sebastian is now Master of the Shadows and it works remarkably well. He can snap to most walls, turn corners, and quick run to nearby cover all with ease. The skill tree grants him other essential abilities like being able to move more quickly when crouched, and stealth kills from behind corners. Hunting your prey, watching their routes, and picking the best moment to strike is an exhilarating experience. There's so many different environments to take on the basic enemies in that I never got bored. There's even a way to throw a bottle and lure them away from the group. You can also run from an enemy that saw you and carefully find a place to hide. This works extremely well, most of the time, and allow me to avoid confrontation unless absolutely necessary. Every so often, when you're going in and out of houses, looting and crafting, and then carefully watching the grotesque creatures patrol outside, The Evil Within 2 is a lot like The Last of Us, and that's some of the highest praise I can give any game. Part of this feeling comes thanks to a shift from linear areas to more open, small sandboxes. There are only a very small number of these areas, but they are the most fun I had with the game. Sebastian is given a communicator that can, for some reason, locate nearby items, and other points of interest. Exploring the areas for those items, figuring out how to get into a train car, a house, or a garage unseen was always a joy. There's even a small amount of side quests, collectibles, and optional scenes to discover. And the linear portions are more complex and interesting now that the player isn't always forced to constantly move forward and miss items. There are still the crazy, like, oh, what's real type scenarios. Ooh, that's exactly how they do it, too. Uh, where things appear behind you or in front of you or disappear and there's jump scares and the light goes out, right? But it, it never captures the fantastic set pieces from the first game where you're running from your life from that spider lady or the keeper. In fact, there's not a single creature that gets to that level of memorability. A handful of impressive and wonderfully creative creatures are thrown your way, but the absence of the hunt undersells them significantly. Instead, these encounters are very evocative of boss fights in Resident Evil 4, and they might even become a regular enemy a few times later on. One of the more interesting mini-bosses, for lack of a better term, is relegated to something that pops up with no fanfare shortly before the final boss. I would have gladly fought it and others like it throughout the entire game. 
The Evil Within 2 is lacking a lot of the creature horror the genre is known for. The basic enemies are zombies in all but name, and the rest of the standard opponents are five other mostly humanoid creatures. Maybe I was expecting too much, but fighting bipeds for 20 hours got less and less interesting every time I saw a weird crocodile lizard with four mouths chase after me. And maybe I'm being too negative, because I genuinely love the stealth gameplay that Evil Within 2 offers. And stealth is really the only way to play it because the shooting is still a little wonky. The camera angle might be better than it was in the previous game, but aiming does not feel natural. I'm not the best player out there, but I've never played a third person shooter where I felt less confident in my abilities. The genre staple of limited ammo just complicates that whole thing further. In addition, the reticle being right over an enemy didn't ever seem to be a guarantee of a hit in certain instances. It appears like in real life that the tip of the gun fires the bullets directly at that point, meaning that enemies to the side or below Sebastian's general position could be missed, even if the reticle is pointed right at them. This is, like I said, only an issue when they're very close, and so, which is something you should probably avoid. It's still incredibly annoying, and it happened enough where I just can't not bring it up. When it works, though, the combat is actually pretty fun with a nice variety of weapons at your disposal. But it feels like a poor man's Resident Evil 4. Quick time events, dodges, or crowd controlling melee attacks would have gone a long way to make the game more compelling and fun. Instead, it can become much too chaotic and imprecise when there are three or more enemies attacking you at once. And there is a melee attack, but it's so lame, like poorly implemented. You can knock enemies down on the ground and stomp them to do an insta kill, or you can kind of stun them and kick them, but it's not. I mean, Resident Evil 4 came out like 15 years ago, and we're still haven't capitalized on it, I feel like. But speaking of the combat, the crossbow returns with its variety of bolts, and now you can easily set up tripwires. It works well, but I was constantly trying to save so much ammo that I only used it when absolutely necessary or during boss fights. Certain elemental bolts can combine with objects in the world, and it's a great, if underutilized, touch. These are things like uh, oil drums you could actually shoot with bullets and they'd light on fire, or using different other sorts of traps for electricity in the water. It's Think Bioshock 1, not to be rude, since that's an old game. Crafting allows you to use various items you'll find while exploring to create bullets, bolts, healing items, but creating them at a workbench requires fewer items than if you're just out in the field creating them. This is such a smart decision and it actually does force you to weigh your options in the inventory screen quite a bit. At a workbench, you can also use weapon parts to upgrade all your weapons, whether it's more damage for all the pistols, a larger clip for all the shotguns, or longer range for the crossbow. There's plenty to upgrade and it was always a good time trying to decide on the next enhancement. That also extends to the skill tree, which has been completely redone from the first game, thank God. Now there are trees for stealth, health, combat, athleticism, etc, and each has a select number of very useful skills. Using the green gel you get from enemies and from exploring, you can increase your stamina, reduce weapon sway, automatically attack an enemy that when you're grabbed, and much more. By the end of the Evil Within 2, you'll have upgraded a good percentage of these skills and feel like a completely different character, and that's exactly what a good skill tree should do. Now there's one large element of survival horror that I haven't really brought up yet, and that's the horror. And the reason for that is simple. It is not a very scary game at all. There are some spooky areas that are dark and trying way too hard, and a few jump scares. But the majority of The Evil Within 2 is an action stealth game with a horror skin, for better or worse. I mean, really an opinion on how you take it. But I certainly wasn't losing any sleep over it. Early on into my playthrough of The Evil Within 2, I likened it to what the first game would be if it was mixed with Dead Rising and The Last of Us. In the end, it just barely misses all three marks. The original was a mess, but it brought the horror and had some very creative boss fights. The Evil Within 2 does not. D Dead Rising has safe houses and people to rescue while surviving on your own. The Evil Within 2 does this maybe twice. The Last of Us offers a new look at ammo and item scarcity in the apocalypse while also evolving how stealth encounters can work in large open environments while exploring. The Evil Within 2 tries this, but ultimately falls back on linear levels and a lack of patience in its combat. I can't say enough good things about the stealth or the almost six hours I spent combing through the first open area, but it started to fall apart the further I got in. Had roughly a quarter of the late game been cut out, it could have been a tighter experience that left me wanting more. Instead, 
I will fondly remember the first 10 hours and have a love-hate relationship with the final 10 hours. The Evil Within is, once again, filled with so much damn potential it can be easy to get caught up in the possibilities of it all. But once you see those possibilities go unfulfilled, you'll wonder if this didn't just need more time in the oven. And that kind of sums up my whole thing to, to finish reading my review of The Evil Within 2 is, man, there's so much potential here. It is so, it's so good. And then it's just kind of, it doesn't even shit the bed. It just kind of levels out to this like, oh, I guess I'm going through these corridors now. Again, I'm fighting these enemies again. The biggest miss to me is kind of what I mentioned in the review with the, the keeper or the spider lady chasing you and having these boss encounters that were all about like running away and they'd be to be tormenting you. You know, you try to escape the spider lady and you'd run away from her. You'd put this, you'd shoot this valve, that shoot fire in her face so you can get away. And you'd do that and you'd be hunted by her for half an hour, an hour. The same with the keeper. And then, then you eventually fight them, right? And it's this awesome moment where you're finally fighting this demon. And this game doesn't do that at all with anything. It's villains, which I didn't even mention. I just realized because it's like completely forgettable. Uh, Stefano and the other guy who doesn't doesn't matter he could be cut entirely from the game and I would not care except for his boss fight S fighting Stefano is lame his little camera obscura creature you might have seen from trailers is really cool but man is it it's just completely underutilized it pops up and does this cool time thing and then you beat it and it's gone it's like this is, you're missing the entire point the in, the entire thing of that made the original so unique because there was a lot about the original that was not unique, but what did were those boss fights, were those being hunted and tormented, not in a way of like Nemesis from Resident Evil 3, but just these constant moments of a creature hunting you during these very distinct scenes. And it's, it's not here at all. It is so forgettable. I, I mean, there's an enemy in the DLC for the original game because the original game it, it, DLC is a lot of stealth. In fact, you don't even have a weapon for most of it. And you can kind of see the influence on this game. It adds in the cover mechanics, like I said. That's more memorable. There's a there's a boss in the DLC for the first game that is more interesting and memorable than how they execute anything in the second game. And that's the biggest letdown because Stefano should have turned into the weird camera creature. I guess that's spoilers. He's not the weird camera creature. But hit, the fight with him is so lame and it's so uh, Wesker from Resident Evil 5. It's not even funny. It's so anticlimactic and really that should be almost the climax of the game because I'd cut out the part after that. It's, I don't want to spoil things, even though it doesn't really matter. There are some great moments in there. There's a cabin-like scene from Resident Evil 4 in this game that I think it does very well. It does a lot of things very well. Like the first open area was great. The second one was okay, but newsflash, the second one's the last one. <laughs> you go back to the second one and now it's on fire. Like oh, That's the third open area. Like, Man, it's just, it's again so close, but no, just not quite there. And I have to feel that they knew this. I have to feel that they knew this going in and like, we're just going to hit this date. We're not going to spend 20 more million dollars. We're just going to put it out now and maybe that'll make them more money. I think that's probably smarter. I'd rather cut this game at like, you know, this could be a 12 hour game and I would have loved it. But the fact that I spent 21 hours with it and six of those hours was like, okay, guys, that's not a really ringing endorsement. I actually do have some, what else did I write down here? I think that's it. This is what I wrote down. <laughs> the big bads are boring and overshadowed by simple mini bosses. And it's so goddamn true. The first time this weird, like severed heads roll together and become this giant creature with like a saw for a hand. I'm like, this is awesome. And then it just becomes a, an enemy later on in like a way that's so tacked on and not interesting. It didn't, it took away it being special. Like that creature should have hunted me through that open area and like you have to fight it and then it just runs away. And then finally, when you get to the next area, it's the boss. But I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me wanting something that it's not, but it, it, it misses on so many accounts that it's death by a thousand cuts because there's nothing really super bad about the game. It's, it's just like, ugh, I can see it. I can see the potential right there and it never, you know, when you finish it and you look back at it, you go, damn, man, 
You really missed a lot of these shots. You took a lot of shots, but you missed a lot. You missed so many. This might be the shortest show I've ever done because I'd, I'd end it right here. There's not much else to say about this game. I did, I mean, I started the review saying I think it's great-ish. You know, it's close to being great. I really, it's tough. It's really tough when you play a game and the first 10 hours are phenomenal. The, like if you had asked me, and you could actually go back and watch my impressions of it five hours in, if you had asked me after 10 hours, like was this one of my top 10 games of the year, I would have said for sure, maybe even top five. And at this point now, I'm like, I don't know, probably not in the top 10. <laughs> And that sucks because the beginning was so goddamn good and you kept seeing like, oh, it's going to do this. Oh, it's going to... No, it never did any of it. It built up Stefano in the worst way possible. Not interesting. They, they, they didn't learn any of the lessons from the first game. Which is ironic because the first game was trying really hard to be Resident Evil 4 and whenever it wasn't, it was better. And they still can't copy Resident Evil 4. Can we get someone to copy Resident Evil 4? The mechanics are perfect. Just copy it. Capcom can't even do it. And they made the goddamn game. Can we just do it? This is yet another game where it just needs a dodge move. Imagine playing Horizon without the dodge button. Without the dodge roll. That's this game. These enemies are way too fast for not dodging. I need a dodge move. It would make it so much more fun. Just make it harder. If you're like, oh, it doesn't make it survival hurry. Just make it harder then. But I can dodge. Fine. I played the game on, on the hard difficulty. It wasn't that hard. It was actually painfully easy, some of these boss fights. I don't know. Maybe in a month, when I think back on this, I'll be more positive. Maybe I'll replay it. I just spit everywhere. Maybe I'll replay it and actually like it more. Who knows? That's Evil Within 2. Merry Christmas. And happy Hanukkah. I don't know. Someone else is here. Someone just popped in. But that's that's basically it. Today was going to be a short show. We're getting ready for Mario next week. And Wolfenstein next week. Good lord. I'm in a twist of fate reviewing Wolfenstein too. So that'll be fun. Because I wasn't planning on on uh, really playing it. And it, it's also a game that I'm not a huge fan of. The first one. I think it's just okay. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. But I think that's it. Merry Christmas. I do this show every Friday, 3 p.m. Pacific time. Twitch.tv slash Game You can see gameplay here. Whee! Look, he's all wet. Anyway. Thanks for hanging out. Joel, what's happening? I'm still at work, but listening. Oh, okay, gotcha. Well, that's it. This is going to be the shortest show. But it's two, two, you know, full segments of writing that I did. I, I looked at the at my Word doc. I wrote almost 3,000 words for this show for like in two days for no reason. But I enjoyed it. And you know what? I'm happy it went to the Evil Within 2. It deserves, it doesn't deserve to be shit on so much. It deserves more praise and more time in the spotlight than it's going to get. Even though it's not the best game ever or whatever. In another year, last year, if this game had come out last year, it would be in my top 10 for sure. But this year's too good. Too damn good. You can't have it. Oh, no. Well, that's a bummer. All right, well, let's end on that weird note. Good Lord, I forgot about that. That might be one of the scariest things in the game. I don't want to look at that anymore. Gross. These weirdos.